Uh, thank you, everybody, for welcoming us. Um, quite excited to be here to talk to you about something called Circo Cares tonight. And as we go through it, I think there are some parallels to the previous session in relation to some of the challenges which the NHS in the UK face. And actually, how, as a team, we went about looking to think about how we could address some of those. And as we go through the slides, hopefully that will make sense. Um, I guess a couple of things, though, that the slides themselves have been pulled together by a fantastic member of my team, somebody who's very talented with the visualisations. But for full disclosure, Christine and I both have had relatively hectic runs up to the session today. So we're going to test the metal of our visualiser in terms of how easy are they to interpret and play back to you guys, because <laughs> it might be the first time we're seeing aspects of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> We'll also do a bit of a pop quiz around this character on the right-hand side as, as I go through the introductions. But for myself personally, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to run Circo Experience Lab. Um, and for those of you who know the name, we've been on a journey as a business. Uh, but I'm really exceptionally proud of where we've come to today. And today is a humble brag of the highest order uh, for, for what I think is a pretty fundamental achievement in relation to a service design project that has led to some really formidable impact and change within the health service. Um, so again, from myself, I've been working now for, for more years than maybe the baby face, but the bad beard would dictate. Um, so 22 years, started life as a technology consultant and then was fortunate enough a few years ago to fly down to Australia and run a UX organisation down there. Came back to the UK back in 2013 and picked up responsibility for Experience Lab and have been working with Christine ever since. Christine. Cool. So yeah, I, uh, I'm head of practice at Experience Lab, uh, like Evan said. I've been there for about five years now. Um, I've been lucky enough to be a researcher for pretty much my entire career. So a lot of my challenges have been a little bit like the project that we're talking about today, where it's in the field, um, talking to people who are going through some pretty challenging situations. Um, I have to say this is probably one of my most exciting and also most challenging projects that I've ever encountered. And we'll tell, show you some of the stories with you today about why that was and, and what, how we went about designing a research project around that. So just a, a quick introduction to, to both Experience Lab and Circo. Um, again, for those of you who don't know and aren't familiar with Experience Lab, we've been around actually for a long time, 17 plus years in the UK and arguably one of the longest standing kind of original UX organisations in London and about. Actually, we were born out of MPL, the National Physical Laboratory. So started off life as a very scientific human factors function and span into a commercial entity which started off life looking at usability testing predominantly. Um, in terms of Circo itself, again, probably mixed perceptions around the room of Circo, but Circo is a company I am hugely proud of and hugely proud to be part of because they do some formidably difficult work on behalf of government and do it with real sensitivity and care. And again, if there's one thing I'd like you guys to take away is that actually at the, the heart of what we're talking about today is this kind of theme of caring and the impact that having a frontline staff can, can create by really caring about what they do and how they interact with people. Um, so I guess a, a quick pop quiz. Who do we think this is? Oh, you see, now Alexa would be proud. <laughs> and, and anybody know the link? So uh, Circo, our parent company, um, has been through some pretty traumatic times back in 2013. And uh, as part of that, we brought in a new CEO, um, a gentleman called Rupert Soames, who's actually Winston Churchill's grandson. Um, so it's quite formidable to be in a room with this character. And I suspect he carries a lot of the same traits that Winston Churchill had. So he's, he's not somebody that you particularly want to get on the wrong side of. Uh, but he is somebody with a kind of laser focus on, on doing the right thing for the public sector and the services that Circo deliver. So moving on then to, to Circo Cares and what we're going to be talking to you guys around today. And I interviewed an individual this morning and that's a shameless plug for the fact we are hiring as well. <laughs> um, so please look us up if this project excites you and, and compels you to. Um, and I got asked a question by the candidate and the question was a bit of a classic reverse psychology in terms of what are you most proud of back at me. And, and the project I went to was Circo Cares. And when I kind of articulated why, it did come down to the fact that when we talk around the impact it's had, and we talk about the amount of people it has touched and, and actually positively impacted, um, it, it's, it's amazing. 
And, and it's something that as a business, as, as Experience Lab, we talk about and sometimes pinch ourselves a bit. Um, and again, hopefully that will come through as we talk through. So Circo Cares itself, just to set the context a bit, um, we're talking about a business unit within Circo Health, um, where we've got 4,000 plus staff delivering frontline services within our hospitals. And the MD came to us with quite a broad challenge, which I'll kind of articulate to you guys in a second. But in terms of the project itself, when we started it, we had no idea where it was going to go. It was a kind of true service design challenge in probably its purest form in terms of we've got a complex space we're operating in. We're dealing with people who are in potentially vulnerable situations. And the challenge was all around what can we do? That was as broad a scope as we got when we started with it. And when we, when we set off on this pathway, we had no idea that it was going to be a social value project. It could have been one which turned into a technology solution, could have been one which was a process design outcome, it could have been one which was around organisational redesign. We really didn't know when we started on this journey. Um, and, and to that end, you know, I, I think it is a really nice definition of a service design project where we had to go out and undertake that true primary research to understand quite a complex ecosystem and come up with hypotheses and opportunities that that presented. So in terms of the brief itself, and this is our health MD, and obviously you guys wouldn't recognise that, I'm not sure he would recognise it himself, um, but he came to us and, and explained the situation that the NHS were in, and I think it goes to the point from earlier, which is you know, over on the left-hand side here, the people who deal with patients on the clinical aspects are under a huge amount of pressure. They're, they're very time poor in terms of their ability to execute on their job. And for anyone who has been in and around hospitals, you'll recognise that. These people want to do everything they possibly can to help patients, but the system itself is continually squashing them. So that was one of the constraints that we had to work within. And in terms of kind of the raw material we were looking at, it's on, on the right hand side here, which was very much in the soft FM space. And I'll explain what I mean by that as I move forward, but it wasn't the clinical care side of life. We weren't going to be able to touch upon how do you treat somebody in a different way from a treatment position. Okay. So when we talk about soft FM and when I talk around the frontline staff that Serco had, what we're really talking about is caterers, porters and cleaners. So a very blue collar workforce. These are people who live and breathe the hospitals. They're in and around them all the time, but can sometimes almost be mistaken as that blue collar workforce and, and they're just there to do a commodity job of pushing a broom or delivering a meal. Um, and that was the context that we had to play within. You know, what can we do with this army of people, this 4,000 plus individuals? What opportunity does that present to Serco? Um, do you want to move on one more? Mm -hmm. But this was a, against a commercial backdrop. So this is where, I guess, the realities of Circo come into play. And essentially, within the soft FM space, within the contracting space for delivering those services, at the moment, the way that the government are running these competitions and awarding them, it's very much a race to the bottom. They're just looking for the cheapest provider of cleaning, catering and portering. And that is obviously quite unattractive to an organisation like Circo because ultimately you get to a point where the margin return doesn't make any sense for us anymore. So we had this as a backdrop and, and Ian's challenge to us was we want to grow. We've got a growth agenda over the next five years as Circo Health, but we're in a position where the market is dictating we need to be selling cheaper. What can we possibly do where we can deliver more, um, potentially charge a little bit more because our, our service adds more value? But within that, Sorry. no, that's good. But within that, we had constraints to work within. So the constraints he presented to us were, were two kind of doozers, if you will. Um, one was, you can't change the operational aspects. So if we do a piece of research and, and it comes up with some brilliant ideas for how we can clean quicker or how we can do something which means we don't deliver as many meals, it's a no-go. We have to operationally deliver everything we committed to as Circa. You have to pour to the amount of patients around the hospital, the contract dictates, etc. So his first opening piece to us was you can't, you can't change that. They have to continue to operate as they do. And then the second piece was if we start to verge into changing health policy and changing what they're allowed to do from things like clinical care, that's probably a no-go too. So we started off with this fantastic opportunity of 4,000 plus staff to look at across multiple hospitals in the UK, a really kind of meaty challenge of take us on this strategic journey for Serco, how do we grow this business? And then 
two hamstrings here. Um, and, and, you know, that, that in itself actually helped the service design process as we moved through it. But it was one of those moments where you went, quite frankly, oh shit, this is going to be pretty challenging. Um, so Christine's going to walk us through a little bit around the actual approach that we took. So again, I've talked about quite a broad church of a challenge that came from the MD of Health. Um, and we obviously had to retrench and work out how we we're going to do that. Um, so Christine's going to talk a little bit around how we actually went about conducting the service design. Cool. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty broad challenge. It's one that where we don't know what the outcome is at all. Um, and we're, when we sat around the table and kind of went, where do we even start? You know, this is a complex environment. It's one that involves lots of different types of people. Um, for a lot of people who are patients in hospitals, this is the worst day of their life. So we have to be mindful of the, the fact that this is somewhere where people are being treated. They're in a vulnerable position. Um, we're dealing with staff who are not normally included in any conversation about their job, um, unless it's one that you've done it wrong. Um, and so it, it's one of those situations where you go, oh God, where do we even start? Um, so when we started thinking about how do we introduce our research team to the hospital, we knew, we knew we needed to study the context. We knew we needed to study how people do their job because if we're gonna Im impact, um, if these people are gonna have some form of impact on how the patient care journey goes, then we need to understand what they do now. How do they interact with patients? How do they, where, where is their job happening? Is it in patient spaces? How much time do they spend with patients? How do they interact with clinical staff? The, the flip side of it is, if you show up with a notebook in a hospital or anything that looks like a clipboard, um, you're literally going to get the look of death because they go, like, oh, what are you here to assess me on? Um, on average, uh, a worker in a hospital ward will be assessed for something related to their job at least once a day. So somebody shows up to check up on their work uh, trying to understand if you're ticking all the right boxes and they're assessing you. And the, um, the, if the quality commission comes in, they're, they're going to check on everything that you do. They're gonna, literally going to do little swabs on the floor to see if your cleaning is up to scratch. And trust me, the managers there are really up to it. Uh, they're really checking up on it as well. Um, and so we were kind of going, oh, how do we get these people to trust us? Because we need them to open up. We need them to talk to us. We need them to share their experiences. Um, and so we thought, well, we borrow something from anthropology. In anthropology, you have to immerse yourself in the environment. You have to be part of it. You have to blend in. When you're a researcher and, and you come into a new context, or you, even if you bring somebody into a lab and sit them in front of a computer, or you go to their home, the introduction of the research um, element changes people's behavior. And we really wanted to see people's natural behavior. So we put on the uniforms. Uh, we became trainees. So our staff, um, this is a picture of myself and Alexa, who's done all the wonderful drawings um, in uniform. Um, this was actually not in the UK, but in Australia, but that's a completely different story. Um, but it's the same concept, same project. And we used a, a program within Circo called uh, Back to the Floor, which often uh, managers or people from other parts of the business use to go and experience what it's like to do that job, to learn what it's about and how does it work. And so basically they treat you as a trainee for the day. Um, and we spent, uh, so we had three teams out in different hospitals. Each of the researchers spent different time, uh, lengths of time with different members of staff, wearing the uniform, doing the job. I've mopped floors in hospitals. Um, I always had somebody checking up, making sure it was up to scratch. Um, I've served people tea. Um, that's quite challenging when you're trying to ask a la um, lady with a very heavy Glaswegian accent and um, who's not very articulate uh, because she's, she's got dementia and she, um, she's struggling to communicate and you're trying to work out, what, sorry, what was that? I'm, I, I'm Norwegian, I don't understand Scottish accents, so apologies for that. But just to kind of understand some of the challenges that they, these people are going through. Some of them are not British. They're coming from all over the world to do this job. It's a low paid job um, and it's one that's often very thankless. So they are, they go through a lot and, and wearing the uniforms really allowed us to experience their job from their perspective. Um, so we spent different shifts uh, with the same person, with, with different people, but on the same wards to understand how the, the sort of ebbs of flow of the, the hospital changes throughout, throughout the day. 
Um, we looked at the same ward from different perspectives. So one day I'd be the catering person delivering food. The next day I'd be cleaning the floors. Um, and then we got to go around the hospital through all the wards by being porters. And what it really just allowed us to see as well was the interactions these people had with patients. Because patients didn't see us as anything different. We looked exactly like the others. Um, and they introduced us as trainees. So they, they would just, the, the patients would talk to us, they would interact with us. And as we spent time with the, the staff as well, we started to kind of build trust and they would open up to us about some of the things that they were worried about, some of the situations they'd been in. One, uh, one of the cleaners um, described a situation a few weeks before we got there where she'd, um, one of the patients that she got very close to because she was on a long-term ward had passed away and nobody had told her and they'd, uh, she'd come in to clean the room and the person was um, in the bed and had the clinical staff knew that the person had passed away but hadn't told her because she wasn't part of the clinical staff. So they don't get always remembered when some of the things go, that happen on the ward. Um, and we, we learnt a lot about how they operate and the, how much they actually cared. And that was the, I think that was the biggest differentiator for us when we started thinking about things, and we'll come back to that. But they could do something else, but they're there. They're still doing that job. Um, and yet we've, we had some really challenging situations that we as researchers faced as well. So I was in A&E as a porter one day when um, a casualty came in and the person didn't make it. Um, we talk, I interviewed patients who were, um, had basically been diagnosed with uh, conditions that would, meant they would never leave hospital. Um, I interviewed a patient who had been in a car accident and his spine was broken and he had a young son at home and he didn't have, he was a single parent. So you get all of these stories where you, as a researcher, how do you deal with that? You know, the, the, there was quite a few times in our various rooms around the country where, as researchers, I think we sat there and we cried. <laughs> but that's part, of, that's part of the experience and, and it's not for everybody, but it's, it's something that also brought a lot of, re, um, of a rewarding feeling in terms of being able to be let into these stories and understand them. Um, and I think also we, we built a, a structure of how we communicated together. Every, every evening after we finished our kind of shifts at the hospital, we'd all get on a call. So the three research teams that were out at any given moment would have a call where we all shared the most difficult stories and then, then reflected on what, what was it that we saw today that was really powerful or really insightful. Um, and I had hotel rooms with post-it notes all over them where we were doing brainstorming in our pairs and kind of th trying to work out what the hell we'd actually captured. Because you can't have your notebook with you. So you have to figure out ways in, in which to have the notebook. Um, and I had, I used to stash mine in the cleaning cupboard. Um, <laughs> one of the girls got started um, carrying around post-it not notes in her pocket um, and would just kind of rush off to a qu quiet corner and make some notes. Because if they see you make notes, suddenly you're doing something different. You stand out. Why are you making notes about me? So it was quite a challenge to kind of make sure we captured all the notes and also making sure that while we were immersing ourselves in this environment, we weren't influencing what we were co coming out with. And we needed a much wider data set to be able to, to make sure that our influences wasn't the only thing that was driving some of our findings. Um, we spent time as research teams in six hospitals in the UK uh, from uh, Fourth Valley up in Scotland, um, all the way down to Margate uh, and um, Derford, so all over the country. Um, all hospitals are very different. They're, they're, I, I can't describe to you how different environments they are and how different the culture is. They're different ward by ward. So you walk onto one ward and you've got this great one team feeling and everybody's included and everybody knows the cleaner's name and talks to them about everything. Walk into the next ward, same hospital, same basic management and you get a completely different feeling and, and they don't even know uh, what the cleaner's name is. They don't care. They're not part of the team. Um, so six hospitals, three teams out, um, lots of data. How the hell do you make sense of all of that? Um, we build a war room. So we do this for a lot of our projects. But this one in particular, we rented a space for, I think, what, three months? Um, where we all kind of brought everything together and everything came together. And actually, this was how we presented back to the team that, at Circle Health as well. We created a walkthrough of all of the things that we'd found. Um, and they'd never seen anything quite like it because normally somebody comes with a PowerPoint presentation and go, all right, let me tell you about all my findings. 
we, got, we took them through all of our findings and they got to come and visit um, as, we were, as things were emerging. We were able to talk, talk them through where we were up to. Um, it got a bit crazy with the post-its. I do apologise to the environment for all of the post-its that were used. But um, it was a big team. It was a crazy challenge. And we spent a lot of time trying to make sense of it. So what I want to move on to is some of the things that started to make sense. Um, and and I, I think to understand some of the things that made sense, you need to understand some of the um, things that are true about the people that were trying to change or make use of. They're low paid. Most of them are on um, basically living wage. Uh, they are usually, over, they feel they're overworked. Um, they are sometimes, they're sometimes not. Um, porters in particular, I think, have a bit of an easy job of it. They, they walk a lot, but uh, they love their job. I think the cleaners probably have the hardest job. Um, and they couldn't make more money so, so, uh, selling sausage rolls down at Greg's. There was, there was a beautiful articulation in one of the sessions where a reporter literally said, I'll get more money by pushing sausage rolls around Greg's than I do by pushing patients around the hospital. But I choose to do this because actually it means something. It's more than just pushing a sausage roll around. Yeah. And, that, and that, was the, that was one of the breakthroughs. They care. They stay because they care and they really try to have an impact. And we saw a lot of people who had an impact. They just didn't realise what the impact they were having. So they stay because they care. And I'm going to hand back to Gavin now to talk through some of the insights that came out of this. Because there were a lot of things coming together. There was desk research, there was in-field research, there was all of the war room stuff. Um, but what came out of it um, kind of pulled all of that together and really um, is quite a compelling story. So um, as you can imagine, that war room, the content in the war room provided huge amounts of opportunities, all sorts of different ideas that could potentially benefit the healthcare system. You know, some examples might be, can we actually ask these non-clinical staff to start doing some of the clinical roles? So actually, one of the ridiculous things is they're not allowed to touch patients. So if a meal gets delivered to a patient who's in a lying flat position, they need to call for a nurse to come to sit them up to eat their meal. And that can be 45 minutes. So if they've got a hot meal being delivered. So we got some really fascinating opportunities, like if they could just help, if they were allowed to touch the patient, you can address some of these issues. But fundamentally, kind of cutting through that were three key areas. And, and this first part really came from not only the in-context research, but the desk-based research that went before it. And it was around how do you impact the mental attitude of a patient in hospital? And broadly, the thinking behind this goes, if you can impact in a positive way somebody's mental attitude, they do recover quicker. There's a huge amount of evidence out there which proves that. So we had a bit of a working hypothesis there, which is if we can help those patients stay in a more positive mindset, that's going to aid them in recovery and therefore that's going to address one of the bed blocking issues that the NHS faces. And actually what you'll see here is through the research we did, we identified a number of factors which influence that positive mental attitude. And it's everything from the feeling like you've lost control, you've suddenly become a child in this hospital environment, to the social interaction need, to the fact that you've just checked into a completely alien place. All of those factors have a, an impact, either positive or negative, depending on how they're consumed and delivered by the patient. This one for me is, is super powerful. So when you actually look at the interactions per day between the clinical staff and the patients and between the non-clinical staff and the patients, you have a ratio of 5 to 14. So 5 in terms of the clinical touch points, 14 in terms of the non-clinical. But, but moreover, this interaction by the clinical staff is all around treating the condition. They simply don't have the time to engage with the individual. They are there to treat the condition. I'll move on to the next one. And then the final piece, and there is some beauty in the simplicity of this programme. We had some people behaving in a way which was just fantastic. They were doing things above and beyond their day job, if you will. Um, so we had some real star behaviours there, but they didn't know why they were doing it, and they didn't really understand the impact of what they were doing. So the way that they were engaging with the patients, they just did it instinctively. They were there because they wanted to make a difference. But nobody had ever said to them, that's hugely important. That's a really valuable thing to do. So part of this was just identifying that and holding it up and saying, what you do every day when you go and engage with Mrs. Miggins and you tell her about the news and you bring the outside world in and you make it feel more human has a huge impact on that patient. And you are now part of the patient recovery pathway. 
So those three things essentially sit behind the Circo Cares programme in terms of if you can promote and empower your frontline staff, these blue collar workers, to recognise the importance of their role, and then you can help them in achieving that, suddenly you unlock the positive mental attitude piece and you take advantage of the amount of time that these individuals spend in and around patients. Um, so that then led us to an interesting challenge because you come up with this fantastic idea of we can create some stars who positively impact people. But we're fundamentally talking around a mindset change here and an emotional change. We're asking people to recognise how important they are. We're not giving them a to-do list. We're not telling them how to, to engage with patients and do the have a nice day American approach to whatever hospitality may be. We're actually fundamentally saying to them, we need to tap into that part of you which cares, which really wants to help patients beyond just doing your job. And it's an overused one, but one of the things which describes it quite well is that kind of classic story of if you ask the caretaker at NASA what his job is, his response isn't to clean the floor. His response is to put the man on the moon. And we're trying to do the same with the guys in the hospital setting. What's your job? Your job isn't to clean the floor. Your job is to be a part of the patient care pathway and on helping people recover. And that was what stood behind this. And that then brings the next challenge, which is, well, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you take a workforce through a cultural change programme like this? And again, it had to feel different. If it felt like a health and safety training course, if it felt like here's your binder and your checklist and your to-do list, we'd failed before we even started. Mm. This... Also, these people often had quit school. They weren't necessarily people who had gone through education all the way through. Some of them can't even read. So this can't be just your average training programme if you're really going to impact the whole 4,000-plus 4, staff. So, so what, we, what we came up with, and again, this was, I guess, one of the design iterations, we had to work out how to do this. So we've got this answer. We've got this end solution we want to get to, but how do we actually get there? So we recognised that there needed to be an emotional jolt. There needed to be a wake-up call to make these guys realise how important they were and the impact they could have. So we actually got a, a kind of short feature film created which really brought to life, through quite a dark documentary, the importance of their role and the impact it could have. And before they got involved in any type of training or workshops, they were shown that. And then we had a two-week gap where they could reflect on that and think about the importance of their role. And then equally important was running the workshop sessions. And we were very, very careful not to call them training sessions. These were immersion sessions. These were sessions where actually the clinical guys and the non-clinical guys could go through some role-playing, they could think about what it actually meant to engage in a more positive way on a daily basis in and around patients. And, and the feedback from it was, was phenomenal. You had some of these people going in who were very sceptical and who were sick to death of training programmes. And actually they went into this and they were engaged and they understood because quite frankly we were treating them as grown-ups. We'd stopped treating them as a commodity cleaner and started to actually recognise the importance of their role within the hospital setting. And I guess one thing I'll never forget and I know we're up against time, but just a, a quick anecdotal story um, in terms of how important these guys are was a story we encountered around a porter. And when this porter had to deal with an a infant death, one of the things that he would do when he was taking the child to the mortuary was to sing to the child. And he, he would do this primarily for the family. So just that duty of care, that actually recognising that this is a hugely traumatic time and that simple act made such a profound impact on that family in terms of caring and really recognizing the importance of that role and that's one that it sends shivers because it's just it, it's so it's so impactful and a couple of slightly lightly hearted ones if you will um, so this this was the staff up in Wishaw who were able to put on a wedding um, for this lady whose mother was in palliative care, so um, you know, approaching the end, end of her life. But they went above and beyond. They came in at the weekends, they dressed the church and they ran the ceremony for her. And again, it was all off their own back. They chose to do it because they started to recognise how important their role was. And again, I really love this one. This is, this is for the kind of children's ward. This is to try and make eating fruit more interesting. And again, this is one of the caterers. She's just taken upon herself to do this. So both of these examples, I think, are great illustrations of not telling them how to do it, but empowering them to do it and explaining how important their role is. They, they chose to do this. We didn't say to her, wouldn't it be great if you made a sausage dog out of a banana? She went ahead and did that because she knew it would have a positive impact on the patients. 
Yeah, and the important thing as well, they're not measured on this, but they are encouraged to do it. And I think that's a really powerful element of it because they're measured on everything else. So just to rapidly close it out, um, I, I spoke at the beginning about the size of the workforce. 4,100 individuals across the UK now in terms of the Serco staff have been through this programme. And if you do a very fag packet kind of mathematical piece of how many patients have they touched, it's hundreds of thousands now. They are engaging in a way which has impacted hundreds of thousands of individuals who have been in the hospital setting over the time this programme has been running. And I won't walk through all of these, but they give an illustration of the impact it has actually made on the ground. This isn't just a nice piece of hypothetical design. It's, it's living and breathing in those hospitals and making a real difference. And, you know, just to anchor that, and so it's not about us congratulating ourselves. These are kind of three pieces which have come from independent organisations around the impact of the work. And I won't read verbatim the Steve New piece, but at Oxford University had a look at it and, and were quite blown away by the programme of work. And we received a Patient Experience Network Award um, at the tail end of last year, which is typically given to NHS trusts. And the chance of it coming to a private sector organisation are exceptionally slim, but the power of this programme meant that they awarded that to us. And the most recent one was an NHS star, uh, staff award, which again is predominantly given to the NHS, but the impact that the staff made because they lived and breathed Circo Cares meant that they won this award up in Scotland. And that is about three minutes over time. Megan, you gave me an easy time there, <laughs> which I appreciate. It was painful, it is, it's my description of it. Uh, I think we went in a lot of different directions before we settled on this one. Um, the thing that unlocked it was we'd done our desk research originally um, and found lots of stuff around positive mental attitude, but it was this uh, big study that uh, we uncovered, which actually came, I think, originally from a sort of more how you manage uh, sports people. Um, and and the ki how you motivate them to, to perform better or how you help them perform better and how that you that had also started looking at how they recover from injury quicker and it started to unlock some of the things that we'd kind of talked about and seen and we knew that from our research people had um, a real impact so some of the stars that we encountered had some real impact on how people felt about being in hospital one patient told me they're the only people who talk to me about anything other than my, um, my condition. And I really just need somebody to tell me that there's a world outside this door that I can they'll, uh, one, bit, one day go back to. Um, and I think the example he pulled out was just this cleaner who would come and talk about tennis. Um, and it was as simple as that because there's no TV, there was no TVs in this hospital. So they, all they could rely on was um, newspapers. And, and it's like you don't get them fast enough because you have to wait for the trolley to come around. So just that powerful impact of, of having a conversation that wasn't about medical care um, and the positive nature of that. I think the other aspect that we were very fortunate with was the MD of Health, the, the kind of the key stakeholder at the beginning in the commissioning of the project, actually saw the value in letting this process breathe but was keen to be part of it as well. So the ability to immerse him in that data, bring him into the war room, start to articulate some of the opportunities and actually get a bit of a steer from him, you know, having lived and breathed the NHS for a number of years in different roles, was hugely helpful. So just bringing that stakeholder in and, and getting the steer was, was a really key part of directing where we went with the information. Yeah, but I won't lie, it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I ask about, so briefly, the 50, 60, 100 ideas that are coming out. How do you prioritise them and, and do you use any metrics for that? That's a, it's a really good question and I'd love to um, give you a story around an amazing innovation framework we've got for evaluating the impact, <laughs> but it wouldn't be true. Um, That's the bit we're working on now. <laughs> <laughs> now, essentially, we work very closely with the health business unit here. And the, the, the way that this now works is we have a Circo Cares programme board which collates and goes through each of these, but we get a weighting from the hospital that it's come from. Because some of these are quite localised, so... A good example is up at Wishaw. They came up with the idea of, of um, putting in place a hairdressers, which might sound nuts, 
But actually, if you think about the impact that can have on the patients, and our staff said they wanted to run it and came up with a business plan for it and priced it accordingly. So to a certain extent, um, we do let the appetite and the thought that comes from the frontline staff drive which stories go through, obviously within the bounds of clinical safety and, and what you're allowed to do. Um, your brief, as far as I understood it, was to do more with less. Um, and, and so I guess, uh, would you elaborate on, on how you save money? We um, didn't actually, did we? So I <laughs> <laughs> it was it was less of a it wasn't doing yeah, more with less it was doing more with the same. Absolutely. So you couldn't change what they do or how many staff you've got or because that's contractually just locked in, and you have such tight performance indicators that just keep you to this crazy schedule. Sometimes one of my favourite examples was um, sometimes well so this one hospital said we get penalised more. Uh, if we miss a linen pickup, then if we miss a patient pickup. So if you charge us more per uh, linen pickup we miss, we're going to send somebody to pick up the linen, not the patient. The patient missing their appointment at radiology is now putting that department out for the whole day. So it has, there's some really crazy metrics out there and it's, it's, um, it's yeah, it was quite a challenge to work I th with. I think, and it's, it, it, it's a great question. And one thing which was um, actually quite enlightening about the process was we got to the point of coming up with the idea and the concept. And then we started to talk around how do you measure it and what commercial measures can you put on this metrics to, to look at the value it delivers. But we realised that if you started to do that, you risked killing it. Because essentially you were tapping into somebody's vocational, emotional kind of attachment for wanting to help. And then suddenly you're saying we're doing it because it's saving us money. So we went through a really challenging time of going, it's dangerous to try and financially manage this. We need to manage success. We need to think about how we go this has achieved something, but if we apply the traditional commercial financial measure on this, we will kill it. So we, we chose quite consciously not to go down that route, and we started to look at things like um, staff attrition, we started to look at things like staff sickness, and then we started to look at things like patient satisfactions, which aren't direct financial indicators, but they're clear measures of success. Mm -hmm. and, and over the course of time, you know, for me, I am quite commercially minded by background, where it will have that financial edge piece is when it comes to future opportunities, because actually we do it in a different way. We're not the service providers who do it super cheaply and don't give a crap. We're the service providers who actually care. And Circa have chosen to do that without seeking the almighty dollar. They've chosen to do it because it's the right thing to do. In actual fact, they've invested quite a lot of money in rolling Absolutely. this out because this is yeah. coming entirely from the company. Um, none of this is paid by the NHS. Um, and I, I think also, to kind of build on that, the, the, power, the power of it is for me that people are just encouraged and empowered to do this. They're not told they have to do it as part of their yeah, job. Sure. And if you make it a, a kind of key thing they're measured on, they're just going to stop doing it because they're measured to death. Um, and yeah, it's just not going to work. One more question from anyone? Uh, I'm just wondering if you had a uh, any perspective from an international comparison of how things are done in Australia, how things are done in Norway? <laughs> Yay, somebody asked that question. Um, as I alluded to with my slide with me and Alexa in, um, that was in Perth, Australia. So we, Circo is a global business, so they, they asked the question, could we take this, which is working really well in the UK, and take it to Australia where we also run a hospital? Um, and we went down there to do the same study in a much smaller scale, um, but to look at some of the differences between the, the different contexts. Now, this hospital in Australia is completely different than the NHS. So NHS will have like eight people per, per ward. Um, it's an, often an old building. Um, this hospital is brand new, less than 10 years old. Everybody gets their own room, except for, you know, if you're really unlucky, you get a two-person room because they need to have some that are like family rooms. Um, so if you're really unlucky, you might end up in a two-person room. Um, but it's all like all the latest equipment, everything. Um, but what we found was actually this can work there. Their staff were delivering a great customer experience. Problem is hospitals are not somewhere you're a customer. You don't choose to go there for most things. People aren't there because they wanted to be in hospital. They're there because they're having the worst day of their life and they need help. Um, it's not true for everybody. Some t sometimes people come in for electives, but again, it's not somewhere you choose to be. So you can't have the same service as what you have in a hotel. 
but they run like it's a hotel and they pride themselves on delivering a five-star service, which is great, except it's not quite what patients need. And so we're looking at how can we bring this uh, and reshape it for that particular hospital. So we, we are doing that I mean, and we think it can reach wider. One really nice example that brings that to life that, that Christine and the team identified was this, this idea of delivering the five-star hospitality type experience within a hospital actually drove them to try and be invisible to the patient. They tried to be so that they weren't disrupting the patient. They were kind of doing almost that concierge in the back when you don't see them unless you actively seek them. And from what we saw, that was actually not what patients want. They yeah. need that engagement. They need that interaction. So, you know, what they were trying to do was founded on the right motivations, but actually for that particular setting in the hospital, wasn't delivering the right outcomes. Yeah, so one of the patients I spoke to there, he was 500 miles from home or something like that. He had nobody um, to talk to and he's in a room by himself pretty much all day. He can't move, he can't get out of bed at the moment. It's a pretty lonely existence. So actually if somebody came in and, and talked to him for a bit, he'd be quite happy, but the cleaners are instructed not to interrupt. It's like, okay, that's, that's something that we can change. And actually a lot of the cleaners there or, or the, the FM staff that we talked to, um, were very much positive about, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to do more. I, I think I can, but I just, I'm, I'm not really in, allowed to. Yeah. And then the final piece is we've looked at the Middle East too, and I won't start the story, but it's completely different again. And that presents some really fascinating challenges. Yeah, thank you. Can we thank all those speakers and everybody?